Okay, so in this video, we are going to um, talk about the D4 Tanabe Sugano diagram. This diagram is going to be applicable for uh, D4 octahedral complexes called the D4 Tanabe Sugano, Sugano diagram. But additionally, it's going to be applicable for um, the D10 minus 4, or um, more, uh, more appropriately, the D6 tetrahedral complexes. So either of these complexes, you're going to use the D4 Tanabe Sugano diagram. So before we dive uh, into that, it's useful to go over the meaning of the axes here. So um, E <clears throat> is the energy of the transition. We have the ground state at zero E, and all these are excited states above that. And it's in units of B, which is the Rockoff parameter, which is a measure of electron-electron repulsion. So we have this as a unitless quantity because we're dividing by B. It's basically saying how many times more is the energy of the transition compared to B, the rock up parameter. Same idea here with delta, which is the ligand field strength. Um, again, it's unitless in terms of B. And uh, we have something uh, interesting here where um, we have sort of three different regimes. The first regime is when we have zero ligand field strengths. That's where we don't have any ligands at all. And we just have a free ion. And so we have these uh, atomic term symbols. You can see things like quintet D, uh, triplet H, triplet P, triplet F, triplet G, singlet I, et cetera. Those are all your atomic term symbols. So talking about just the cation of the transition metal itself, no ligands, spherical symmetry. Um, but then when you put some ligands on, you go into octahedral or tetrahedral symmetry and um, your ground state then becomes a, uh, it's no longer the uh, quintet D, but it's now a quintet E. So same spin, but we've given it now a molecular term symbol nomenclature. Um, and we are on the left side of this dividing line. We're relatively weak field ligands. And so this is uh, the high spin case. So this is with weak field ligands, right? Or relatively low, um, uh, low delta here. On the other side of this, we have our low spin case, and that's with our high field, uh, or, or strong field ligands is what we, we usually call it, strong field ligands. And in this case, um, we have a much greater value of, um, of uh, delta, and we have a lower spin. We can see we're a triplet instead of a quintet in the ground state. And we have a spin crossover point, um, which is shown by this vertical line. And so uh, what we have to do here now is I just want to go through why the quintet uh, E is the ground state in both of these cases. And so we have an octahedral complex. And so we have to remember the crystal field splitting of octahedral is uh, T2G, three low-lying T2Gs, and two higher-lying EGs. And we have um, D4. And I'm gonna talk about first just the high um, spin cases for both of these. So that we're gonna be focusing on the uh, left side of this diagram. So these are gonna be um, ligands like uh, water for first row transition metals um, and you know, halogens and other uh, weak field ligands like that. And so I've, you know, other videos explaining how to figure out if a complex is, is high spin or low spin. But uh, because this is high spin, that means we're gonna put one, two, three electrons unpairing them. And the fourth electron, because it's high spin, this dictates that we put it in the EG, meaning there's um, uh, too much of a penalty to pair it. And this gap, the delta O gap is relatively small, right? That's what this delta means. And so might as well, it's more favorable, energetically favorable to put that fourth electron in the EG versus paying the electron-electron repulsion penalty um, by pairing it in one of the lower T2Gs. So uh, why do we get a quintet here? Well, we have to use the 2s plus 1 multiplicity rule. And we have a 1 half plus 1 half plus 1 half plus 1 half. So that gives us a spin of 2. 
And so that gives us five. Hence where we get a quintet four. For tetrahedral, um, we have a similar situation, but we have to remember that the uh, crystal field splitting diagram is reversed. We have the E on the bottom and the T2 on the top. Um, and we drop the Gs because we, there's no inversion center. Our G means garata, symmetric with respect to inversion. We don't have that for the uh, tetrahedral symmetry. There's no inversion center in tetrahedral. But we have six electrons, high spin. So again, we're not going to pair them if we don't have to. So one, two, then we go three, four, five, and six. And again, we have one, two, three, four unpaired electrons. Um, and so that's gonna get us four times one half, one half plus one half plus one half plus one half. So that gets us uh, S equals two, two times two plus one is five. We call it a quintet, spin multiplicity of five. So that's just showing why the ground state here has spin multiplicity of five. Um, I think that's just, you know, good sanity check to make sure that you're understanding stuff. But um, what we're going to do next is figure out the spin allowed transitions. And so um, spin allowed transitions only occur when you go from the ground state to the excited state without changing the spin multiplicity. So the first one is just going to be this quintet um, T2 here. And uh, we can write that transition as uh, quintet EG. We have the G because we're an octahedral. We're talking about the D4 octahedral. That's the ground state. And we're going to quintet T2G. And for tetrahedral, it looks very similar, except we don't have the Gs. And so it's quintet E is our ground state going to quintet T2. Now, here's a very, very common confusing mistake that people always make or very frequently make um, and answering homework or test problems with these tanabe sagana diagrams with spin crossover points, with high spin and low spin. They get this part right, but then they look over here and they see, so that was T2G, uh, uh, or quintet T2, for T2G for um, octahedral. They look over here and they say, I see another quintet T2G uh, for octahedral. So I have a second transition. No, you don't. That's the same line. So you have to be careful. That's the same excited state, but for the low spin side. So if you follow this line back, right, it's just labeled twice to help you figure out where it's going. If you follow this line back, it went back to the one we already um, account accounted for. So that's it. There's no other, uh, there's not two, this isn't a separate state. There's not two spin allowed transitions here. There's only one spin allowed transition. Um, because they don't want to double count this quintet 2TG. You can see all the other ones here. We have a triplet, a singlet, a singlet, and a triplet. Those are all uh, spin forbidden. They're going to be very, very weak. So for what we can conclude here is for high spin D4 octahedral complexes, or equivalently for high spin D6 tetrahedral complexes, we only have one spin allowed transition. So we're going to have one main peak in our um, UV visible spectrum. All right. So now let's do the same thing for our low spin. So I'm just going to mark these again, um, high spin and low spin, to annotate these for ourselves. And let's do that same uh, thought experiment where we just convince ourselves um, that, you know, we do have indeed a triplet. And so we're talking about low spin here, just, just to make sure we're on the same page. And again, it's gonna be D4 octahedral complexes that are applicable here, or D6 tetrahedral, the D10 minus four. Tetrahedral complexes, you always use the D10 minus N uh, tanabe Sagana diagram. So if you have a D6 tetrahedral complex, use the D4 uh, tanabe Sagana diagram. If you have a D4 octahedral complex, use the D4 Tanabe Sagana diagram. This is the diagram for you. All right, so why is it a triplet ground state down here when we are with a high, uh, a strong field ligand when our delta is, is, is very large? Well, let's draw out our diagram. Um, now our, our delta OH is very large, as we just said, relatively large, delta O. And we put our uh, three electrons, unpairing them. And now our fourth electron we pair because 
it's too unfavorable to put it up here. We rather pay the electron electron penalty. The rock off parameter um, is not an, uh, enough to dissuade us from putting it in down lower. So um, we do our spin multiplicity business. Two s plus one is our rule, and we have a one half and a one half. Here we have a one half and a minus one half. They're paired, so that cancels each other out to be zero. So we just have a plus one half and a plus one half, and so we have that gives us a spin of one. Uh, which gives us a spin multiplicity of three, a triplet. Two unpaired electrons gives us a triplet. What about for the D6 uh, tetrahedral? Well, first you have to write the correct um, crystal field splitting. And oh, sorry, I didn't label these. This was T2G and this was EG and, and, and tetrahedral, just as we showed um, on the previous slide. We had uh, E and T2, we drop the Gs because uh, inversion doesn't exist in tetrahedral. And we go and we have six electrons, one, two, three, four, five. And again, we are low spin. Um, uh, we are, we are low spin here. So we already made a mistake. Now you can see I was hesitating. We made a mistake. Um, we blasted through this too fast. We started doing high spin because we uh, didn't pair things when we had the option. So we got to erase this and let's start over. One, two, now the penalty for Delta T here, tetrahedral, this just says Delta because it's generic. It could be Delta T or Delta O, right? It's an obvious the diagram applies to both. So they keep it generic. Delta T here is we're saying it's very large, large enough to be low spin. So we go one, two, three, four, five, six. Now we still have two unpaired electrons. We're D6 low spin, and that's gonna get us a triplet again being here. So it all works out. What are gonna be our spin allowed transitions in this state? Well, we're gonna have a lot of them. And so our first one, um, let's say we have a, a delta divided by B of about three and a half. Our first one is gonna go to the triplet E. We are looking for triplets to triplets. When the spin multiplicity doesn't change, those are your spin allowed transitions. So our ground state for the octahedral, right, is triplet T1G. We have the G for octahedral. Our ground state for the tetrahedral is triplet T1, drop the Gs. Our excited state, our first excited state, our lowest excited state one is gonna be going from always on the ground state to the excited state, which is triplet EG for octahedral, and then our ground state to our excited state, which is triplet E, drop the G, for uh, tetrahedral. This was octahedral. Now, our next one, if we're at the same ligand field strength here, is going to be exciting an electron up to our next triplet. And there's a very similar one right here, a little bit higher in energy, is the triplet T2G. So we, went from the ground, we go from the ground state, triplet T1G, to the excited state triplet T2G. And same thing for tetrahedral, but we just drop the Gs, easy as that. Next one is going a little higher. So in green here, um, we excite electron from the ground state to the excited state, and it's a triplet A1 or triplet A1G. We're talking about um, Octahedral. So again, we go from the ground state, triplet T1G, to triplet A1G. Just got it from there. And this one, we do the same thing, but drop the Gs for tetrahedral. And we keep moving along here. We have another one. There are a ton, um, not a ton, but a lot relative to some of the other diagrams. This is our fourth excited state. So we get triplet T1G. Um, and this one is a different. Uh, symmetry, it's A2, and we add a G for octahedral, and triplet T1 to triplet A2, drop the Gs for um, tetrahedral. At this point, you know, we actually technically have one more. It's way going to be high in energy. The diagram doesn't show it, but this line continues, right? And it's, it's going to be um, technically allowed. It exists, and so that's going to be our fifth one, T1G to, again, triplet A2G. 
it wasn't even shown on the low spin side of the diagram, but this line will continue um, going somewhere. And the slope may change, but it's still gonna exist. It doesn't just uh, disappear. Um, and so that is technically going to be loud, but it's so high in energy that, you know, for practical purposes in a UV vis spectrum, it's not gonna show up. So you're gonna have four main peaks um, in most UV vis spectrum. This one will be off the charts, too high in energy. And depending on the strength of the ligand, you know, even some of these higher ones, the scan range that you go in your UV vis spectrum, you might not even show some of these other ones.